Hello and greetings, this is Joe Lameem, and guess what? I just got invited to Peach's Castle for a party, and guess what else? I'm at the party! I'm at the party, in the castle, in the game, Paper Mario! Yes, Paper Mario for the Nintendo 64, a game that was considered to be a sequel to Super Mario RPG during its development. It became its own original game with a new name after Nintendo cut ties with Square Enix following the release of the first game and got intelligence systems to work on it instead. Square had some control and ownership of the original game, so with Nintendo cutting ties with them and the complications between the two of them, Paper Mario was never going to be Mario RPG 2 anyway. The game is called Mario Story in Japan and Paper Mario everywhere else. The name Mario Story is derived from the story-like and picture book pop-up book-like art style that the game got as a result of intelligence systems wanting to make a Mario RPG that was not like the mainline games such as Mario 64 or Mario RPG which Square partially owned. Now the game itself doesn't take advantage of the paper aesthetic enough to warrant the name that it got, but sequels like the highly successful Thousand Year Door made up for this. So what exactly is my part in all this? Well, the thing is, anybody can just tell the same story and run through of the game itself, but what is it like to actually be a part of it? What if you could put yourself into the story and actually interact with all the characters? What if there was more to the story than the game itself would show you? What I'm offering is a perceptive perspective on the game. The key to being able to enjoy the same thing over and over is to experience it differently each time. A fresh new perspective and experience over an already familiar set of emotions that you're going through. That's what I hope to accomplish here and in future videos, literally exploring video game worlds given the circumstances. Let us begin. The so-called Mario story starts with the promised style of a picture book opening with Kami Koopa taped into one of the pages right before Bowser intervenes and gives this story its plot and purpose. The idea that Bowser is the main villain outside of a mainline Mario game is usually frowned upon since we like to be able to use and control Bowser, such as in these games. But since this is the first Paper Mario game, we'll let it slide. I'll also let slide the fact that the concept of the Star Rod and a Star Haven is either ripped off of or heavily inspired by the Kirby games. And that's just the game intro. Start a new file with a new name and we come to a mail call outside of the Mario Bros house and Luigi getting it and opening it. An opening that would get reused in Thousand Year Door. It's an invitation from Peach to a party at the castle, which Mario and Luigi go to the former of which can't be controlled yet until they both reach the castle and even then Luigi won't let Mario leave of course. Mario is now free to explore the castle at this point but he can't explore any of the smaller rooms in the castle yet except for the kitchen and Peach's room if he talks to the toad guard enough times but he can talk to and get to know all the NPCs at the party. Foreshadowing. Oh look there he is right now talking to someone. He can get to know everyone in the castle too bad he can't get to know the castle itself right now, and by he, I really mean the player controlling him, whoever they are. The parts of the castle that we can see now before our first fight against Bowser, which is fixed to be lost, those are all the parts of the castle that we will ever get to see while the castle is on the ground. Anything we don't see now will not be seen until after the castle is uprooted. And even when the castle is back at the end of the game, we don't see any part of it except for the foyer. This always bothered me when I played the game as a kid, and it kinda still bothers me now. We never get to explore the rooms we didn't get to explore before, except for the kitchen and Peach's room. We don't see any part of the castle beyond the big glass window while it's on the ground. We don't see the stairway to the room until after the fact, or the roof walkway, or the last tower with the final safe block, and we never see the balcony when it isn't smashed to make way for a bridge to the final battle's platform after that. I'll be right back. A few moments later. There! I have seen every part of the castle and Bowser hasn't even uprooted it yet! I feel something no one else in real life is ever going to feel! Unless someone were to make a ROM hack to make these areas accessible! Accessible when the castle's on the ground! With the lighting skies adjusted and balcony fixed and all! Why am I still talking? Hope your nitpicky desires are satisfied! Even I've never seen every single part of the castle in this game and it's not just me! Room either. About time. I, 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 I mean. Oh my God! What's happening? So, we should 
shouldn't think too much about how Bowser's castle got under Peach's, should we? It's one thing to believe that it was built under there over time. It's another to believe that Bowser used the power of the Star Rod to do it. Bowser comes into the castle, breaking the only window in the castle that's big enough for him to fit through, battles Mario, and of course Bowser wins since Mario's stats are low from the break he took after his last adventure, and because the story calls for it, Seriously, Mario could have won anyway if it wasn't for the plot device everyone in the story calls the Star Rod. It has nothing to do with the stats, or at least it tries not to, despite me possibly thinking that the low stats had anything to do with it. Even at full power, Mario would still lose to Bowser without the story's other plot device that's supposed to counter Bowser's, which is the Star Beam. After Mario is struck out of the castle, Peach grabbed and kidnapped, Mario falls all the way to the ground somewhere, surviving, and then the game begins. Halt! Bowser has ordered that everyone inside the castle who was at the party be thrown in jail, and that now includes you too. Ugh. I have to respectfully disagree with you. I'm going outside and experiencing Mario's adventure. Well, screw you then. So, where was I? Oh yeah! Mario is revived by the star spirits projecting themselves from their respective prisons. He's taken to the Toad House in Goomba Village by Goombaria, and after he wakes up he meets this nice Goomba family, whose sprites and facial expressions have more effort put into them than the entirety of Sticker Star! Mario tucks the Goomba on the veranda, which falls and breaks off screen when Camry destroys the gate and blocks the way back to Toad Town, which angers Goompapa. Really angers him. Um, there's a fiction that I've been thinking that I'm being sorry and I'm just getting out of fun of the game and I'm pushing that game and I'm pushing that game and I'm pushing that game. I'm not even fucking pushing that ass to push that game. I'm not even fucking pushing 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 that game. I won't know that I was doing that, just that I would never get on the stop with so I ain't know that it would get to me. Oh, I just fixed that girl. Oh, 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 I just fixed that girl. Oh, nobody says get to me. So then Mario goes to check on Goompa and falls down because the veranda fell down when Kami dropped the block on the gate earlier. Of course, Mario survives the fall because everyone in this world is made of paper. What excuse to cheat death would he have if this world wasn't paper? Of course, if Mario can survive a long drop from space, then this is nothing. And of course, Goompa survived too, so the two go looking for a hammer, after which Mario can find Goombaria's dolly to return to her for a star piece, because NPCs and RPGs always lose stuff all the time that the player returns for a small reward. It's par for the course along with items NPCs wanting that the player needs to get. Some places have star pieces, other places have items you give to NPCs for star pieces, usually male. That's how it is. The dolly for Goombaria and the artifact for Colorado. Any letter that's non-chain mail and that's about it. Now to leave the playground, we gotta deal with this little sh** who is apparently the leader of a neighborhood gang that we never get to see or fight. Mario can't win this battle without going into danger since he doesn't have action commands yet. The stone block there is supposed to foreshadow that Mario needs a stronger hammer, duh. In the meantime, Goompa, who acts as a temporary placeholder partner to Mario, teaches him the basics before they make it back to the village of unique non-generic Goombas not like what Sticker Star, Color Splasher, or Origami King would have had if they had their own Goomba villages! Sorry. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mario. It's okay, Goomba. We're just rapping with Mario. Rapping with Mario. Rapping. Closing your door is a great big hit. Sticker star is sticky sh Color splash is very wrong. Or a dummy king that. Come along to Super Paper Mario. Super Paper Mario. Oh, rapping, huh? Sorry. I wanted to give this to Mario. Goombario joins you, and you learn how to use him. The music here is different in Japan because the one from Mario Story in Japan was changed outside of Japan to avoid the risk of a lawsuit since it sounds like West Side Story's America. You better stop there man or you might get copyright ding. A lay motif of the same music exists in the credits music for all versions of the game. Listen. <laughs> After 
Mario joins you, you get the badge, and you break the block, and you're on your way. Don't read the first sign unless you're ready for a fight. The second sign's mushroom doesn't respawn. The heart blocks in this game are like the toad houses. They heal you for free, not like in Thousand Year Door where they both cost money. These red and blue Goombas don't let us reach the save block here before we battle them. Not a good place to get a game over after two sections worth of Goomba enemies, but we do get one before the Goomba King, who is stupid enough to feed Mario the information he needs to press a switch outside his fortress. Ever notice the reactions Mario makes for winning a battle? If a battle was won easily, he wags his finger like he's saying, Don't mess with me! Then we get these evil Koopa versions of the Mutant Ninja Turtles that are original enough on their own, apparently. Yes, they were trained by me, Master Spinner. You know what character I am a spoof of. Your name is Master Spinner? Is that because you're so good at spinning? And you taught them the spinning attack that Bowser gets to see early on, but we don't until the actual chapter boss fight? That's right, and the person watching this video could accept me as secretly canon or not. It doesn't matter. They're also called ROM hacks. For what the case is, let's see if Mario cannot pass this test. So after Mario makes it back to Toad Town, he goes to Shooting Star Summit, and whether he detours over to Merlovely or Merlo for hints and star piece spending, he does meet the Star Spirits again at the summit before we get another cutscene. The game has the nerve to keep shoving that star rod down our throats. We get it game! Bowser has the star rod which makes him all powerful, on top of the star rod being established as the most powerful thing in the game and the source of the most powerful star power. We're not even in chapter 1 yet, and yet you keep reminding us like we're stupid! Anyway, after Bowser and Kami Koopa leave, Peach meets Twink, who like Goombario was originally going to be one of Mario's partners, but wasn't. But he is to Peach what Goompa was to Mario, so I'm not complaining. Not that I would anyway. Of course Twink's star power isn't enough to fight the Star Rod's power. The game establishes that it takes all 7 star spirits and then some to even have a fighting chance against the power of the Star Rod. But Peach is gullible enough to believe for a moment that Twink alone can beat it. But he can't even get her out of her own castle, much less fix everything. That's like believing Gino's star power can just beat Smithy, recover all seven stars, fix the star road, if only you ask him to grant such a wish, if he were to imply that he could grant them. And that's from Super Mario RPG, which predates this game, where the ability to even wish is overridden by the star road being broken. But I digress. I can't help but really feel every time Peach walks out onto the balcony and this music plays. Paying attention to the game's dialogue and listening to this music really conveys the feel of the gravity of the situation that Mario and his partners are in. The situation that Peach is also in. It's part of why we enjoy this game so much. Mario walks back from Shooting Star Summit, and before he learns about action commands which he can do thanks to a lucky star item, he literally bumps Mario on the head while trying to find him, and he gets super excited about it too. TOO EXCITED! Mario then gets to try his action commands out against a blue magic Koopa. Not this blue flying flip-flop freak, just a regular blue magic Koopa who looks like him. Then, Mario has to talk to the Koopa Bros disguised as four suspicious black-dressed toads, if he didn't already, to then get Merlin, who is inside the spinning roof house, to help him and expose them. Then chapter 1 begins. Really game? We already know what the Koopa Brothers look like! We saw them! Mario saw them! We know it's them! Mario tracks all the way to Koopa Village, which is overrun by Fuzzies, an enemy from the Super Mario games that is less annoying in Paper Mario than in games like Super Mario World and New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Look at the way the Koopas put their shells back on when you get them back for them. Thanks for getting my jacket back from those Fuzzies, Mario! You're welcome, Mr. Lameem! Yay! Mario then goes to get Cooper's blue shell back from the Fuzzies, for which there is a minigame, of which the third phase is slightly easier outside of Japan. After Cooper joins you, you can get an HP plus badge, one of the many reasons BP is better than FP, which is better than HP, depending on what kind of player you are. Koopa Koot gives you a measly coin for each favor you do for him, but every once in a while he gives you three star pieces instead to keep making up for it, along with game room credits. 
Koopa Koot's last favor is basically beating the final boss and reaching the game's ending. So in other words, he has no more favors for us once we get every star piece he has with all those single coins in between. But just like the original Super Mario RPG, Paper Mario 1 is one of those RPG games that doesn't have a post game. You defeat the final boss, you defeat the status quo, which obviously can't work for the game status quo as you play it. The Super Mario RPG remake somehow added post-game content that's technically before the end game, before defeating the status quo there, by playing the it was all a dream trope with the final boss after you beat it once. If Paper Mario 1 was remade today instead of being ported to something like Nintendo Switch Online, it would most likely get something like this too. Meanwhile, the sequel, Thousand Year Door, and its remake do have post-games, but I digress. Mario defeats the Koopa Bros and saves the first star spirit who explains to Mario how he and the other spirits can help him fight Bowser and his star rod after they're all saved. Forgive us, Sensei. We have failed you. No, if Mario actually makes it all the way back to Peach's castle, then I will have failed you. We'll just have to train harder and make sure he never gets there then. It's not like he has some other SOB on his ass. Ha! You just called yourself an SOB! Shut up, Green! Ah, the Toadtown Dojo! That's the place where if you're good enough, you can get one of these! Yeah... I remember my first visit to the Toadtown Dojo. <laughs> I've been taking it easy on you, but no more. Your next opponent will be me. Oh! Forget it. If Mario were to do Koopa Koot's favors now and get Luigi's autograph after going back to Goomba's village the long way, two favors ago, Luigi won't be in the basement around the time you do go, which is between Chapter 2's end and the Super Boots. Look at the way Luigi signs the autograph. Exactly! He doesn't! Nintendo didn't spring for a sprite animation of Luigi signing a piece of paper! The same thing happens later after Chapter 2 when trying to get Mer Lovely's autograph for Koopa Koot. Oh hey! You're Joe Lameme! I saw your video about Mario 64! I loved you in it! Can I have your autograph? Make it out to Generality! Oh, sure thing! One second! Um, aren't you going to sign it? Do you have a pen and paper with you? Here you go! What? But I didn't even see you sign it! You didn't even have a piece of paper or a pen a second ago! Do you want it or not? Yeah, okay, thanks, I guess. If Mario uses Che Rippo to manipulate his stats, he can get his HP down to 5, especially if all he upgraded so far were FP and BP. At least one upgrade for each is needed for this. It's game over, man. Here's your order of badges, Ralph. Hey, thank you, Mr. Lemame. Oh, hey, Paracary, what's up? That's not mail, is it, Mr. Lemame? No, I'm not delivering mail. I deliver packages. I don't deliver mail. That's your job. All right, then. Now, if you'll excuse me, I lost some mail over Mount Rugged. I'm gonna go look for it. Bye! Alright, so here you go. Mario should be at the playroom right now. If he's doing save states on jump attack, you can expect those badges to sell out quickly. To sell out quickly. To sell out quickly. The playroom is one of many other new areas Mario can access now. Mario can either hit the tree, or he can have Bombette explode at a certain spot. This was an oversight in the final game. Thanks to Strider7x for making a video about this. If Mario has the silver credit, he can play jump attack. The sign in the room explains the rules of the game, but the toad in the room explains the rules whether Mario reads the sign or not. If the game is played on an emulator or on NSO, you can break the game's economy by using save states, or as NSO prefers to call them, suspend points, to get a perfect score of 950 coins every time. Now Mario can afford all those badges at Ralph's shop, and to play with the Liloinks as much as he wants. Speaking of Liloinks, they're a good source of items, if you know how they work. They're the only repeatable, or renewable, source of Repel Gels, Jam and Jellies, and Ultra Shrooms in the game. Jam and Jellies are also an amazing daisy drop, but that's nowhere near as reliable as these little piggies. Mario Story in Japan also has the gold ones drop Jelly Shrooms instead. Not Jelly Ultras, Jelly Shrooms. Regular red mushrooms with jelly on them that heal 5 HP and 50 FP. Was Danger Mario popular in Japan or something? 
Ultra Shrooms in Mario Story are non-renewable because of this, and less numerous than Wackabumps, and at least three of them are needed to complete the 50 Taste Tea recipes. Let's be honest, these little piggies suck! They're too expensive! It costs upwards of at least 110 coins to get anything from these little piggies. Repel Gels, Jam and Jellies, and Ultra Shrooms are the only three things worth getting from these little piggies. And even then, things like life shrooms and shooting stars can be gotten now if you need them. I mean, if you really need them. It also takes too long to fill up the pen. I hate little oil. Uh? I love little oils. They're a cheap, effective way to get expensive rare items for your money. And you don't have to steal, I mean, win money from the game room as much. No wonder that God, he wishes. Hey, I love them because they're cute, not because they're exploitable, and tell Mario to stop stealing all the game room's money! Mario doesn't need a ticket for the train to Mount Rugged. He can just hop in! Not like the blimp to Glitzville or the expensive luxury train to Poshley Heights, both from Thousand Year Door. This is probably because of how he helped use Bombette to clear the line. And at the end of each station, the respective station master will either say, Mount Rugged! Mount Rugged! Or, Toad Town! Toad Town! What the heck? They each sound like they're cheering for the place they're at. What if the K64 train went to a place called, I Want Eat Paper? I Want Eat Paper! I Want Eat Paper! Dude, you're not supposed to eat paper. Besides, that's technically cannibalism in this world. One interesting thing about the music of Mount Rugged is that there is a slight difference between the one in Mario Story in Japan versus the other releases. Listen. <laughs> Wacka would have made a cool mini boss to fight if you tried to take his Wacka bumps, but like the hustle drink, that's only for ROM hacks of the game, which this video are not about. In other words, fighting Wacka and hustle drinks are two things that went unused in the final vanilla game. One of the letters you have to collect for Paracarry is a chain letter that goes all the way to an NPC that you won't get to meet until chapter 7 at one point. That means that for most of the game, for part of chapter 2 through part of chapter 7, you are stuck with at least one letter in your key item's inventory. But who has time for that? Ah, I got sand in the potato salad! Way to go, buddy. It took us three days to get the ice potato I needed to make this tea make us that potato salad. Three days! The first time that Dry Dry Ruins appears is also the last time that the desert turns to nighttime until you leave the area either outside or into the ruins, which saddens me. Interesting thing about all the rooms with stronger hammers and boots that you get in the game, each one is designed so that Mario can only escape from them if he uses the respective new stronger hammer or boots that he got from the big chest, which is like a hands-on tutorial of sorts versus having a cutie like Toadette show up to show you how the item works. Bootler being scary at the beginning of chapter 3 kinda makes me think of that whole the butler did it cliche for some reason. It's not just something I would feel that any butler would do, given their mannerisms. Even though Tubba Blubba is technically the boss of chapter 3, Many consider the true chapter boss to be his heart, since it has a ton more health than Tubba, who only has 10 health and is more of a second phase to this whole boss fight. Bo joined my party. Like it or not, considering what a useful partner Bo can be, why wouldn't I like it? Is it because she's a classy brat? Think about those paper cursed chests from Thousand Year Door for a second. Let those sink in. Also, those green hyper enemies in the gulch? They seem tailored for you to use bow to avoid their attacks whenever they charge up. It's like those enemies were specifically tailored for the partner that you get for this chapter. It's like everything just works out. Bo said that Tubba Blubba has eaten his last boo. But this isn't true. Obviously we see him eat more boos after Bo said that. So she's wrong! At Tubba Blubba's castle, Mario gets a hold of the beloved Mega Rush badge. It's in a room behind a clock. <laughs> Okay, here I am in Toad Town, in the middle of a Shy Guy riot. Hey, 
Hey, hey, hey, bring back that camera! Hey, stupid shy guy! Hey, stupid shy guy, bring back that camera! Hey, come back here! Come back here! I'm sorry, uh, I need that stuff to record stuff for my viewers on YouTube, like me being in the middle of this riot! So anyway, my camera is being carried off by a shy guy right now! And I don't know what I'm gonna do unless... Oh, hey, thanks again, Mario, for... We're taking out that shy guy. You're the welcome, Jolamine. If you like video, be sure to hit subscribe button and bell icon. Subscribe buttons. Don't hit back. Shy guys with their 7 HP and the new star power of inflicting 7 damage to enemies feels like Scholar's Plower was tailored for it. More tailoring! Thanks, Nintendo. Thanks, Intelligent Systems. Oh yeah, and we have this lemon candy loving optional boss. I will not accept lime candy. Lime candy is for the weak. Shut up! You think a lemon will shut me up? A lime? Meanwhile, nice people give things. Are you a nice person? I wonder if he'll give me my favorite thing, which is a lemon. Ah, all right. A lime. Oh, I missed. Thanks, mister. I'm reading the letter. Okay, got it. Hey, can you deliver this? What, the station master is not going to say, Pink station, pink station. That is one fast fat. The slot machine being at the green station makes sense since green is the color of greed. Not that many people would use it to gamble in this game for the 10 mushroom grand prize. What, with the very confusing pronouns the game gives this partner, is the closest thing to a gender challenged partner in this game like Vivian from Thousand Year Door. Congratulations Mario, you have at least one gender challenged partner in two Paper Mario games, both of them being the good ones we all love. I'd like to talk about how the cake recipe calls calls for eggs, plural, but Peach is seen to only add one egg, one egg, singular, same thing with the strawberry, and there's a grace period of 7 seconds for how long the cake must be in the oven, that's either a long or a short time to bake it, how Peach got the big heavy cake past the guards we'll never know. I smell cake, do you smell cake? Yeah, I do. Maybe Specky Tom made some for lunch. Let's all abandon our patrols and go to that room where Mr. Hammer's having that quiz show later. Just long enough for us to go eat some, shall we? A few moments later. Damn it! There was no cake! Oh well, back to our patrols. But I swear if I smell cake again, we will try this again. <laughs> Tastes like I was baked with only one egg, despite that you must have used multiple and with only one strawberry on top of it despite it clearly having multiple on top of it and you didn't exactly add the bottle in with the butter that was inside did you and it wasn't in the oven for exactly 30 seconds on the dot I think, but other than that... <laughs> Muscular may look young, but like how you shouldn't think too hard about Junior Troopa being a newborn wearing his egg? Don't think too hard about the fact that Muscular is wearing a sailor's hat. Oh hell yeah, you guys kicked the shit out of that mother general guy who must have f***ed off everyone at Toadown with all the stealing and those shy gals we never see each have a nice set of GUNS! Yeah, 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 yeah. DUDE! You need to chill out! Hey, you're the one who wanted me to be out of character. I'm chilled now. After Twink meets Muscular and he's gone, Mario and partners move on to the pier where Club 64 is. And we see Colorado again and the whale. It's a giant tuna! It's not a tuna! It's not a tuna, Colorado! It's not a tuna! My father still hasn't returned from going to fight Hooktail at Hooktail's castle, so please give me this. It's not a tuna, Luigi! It's not a tuna, Luigi! Hey, how'd you know I called it a tuna? 
Doesn't everybody who's confused and doesn't know any better? After we defeat this enemy that we can't tattle on because we need what to see, and the whale makes a Dr. Mario reference, they're off to Lava Lava Island. Hey, aren't you gonna go too, Joe Lamine? Of course, but I am gonna get there in the cringiest way possible. Before we really dive into this chapter, we of course gotta babysit Colorado for a while. Practice before we gotta babysit him inside the volcano. <laughs> Look at that! I'm getting bought by a spear! I can be great for me to use that! The music that plays when the Yoshi kids are all missing is actually on a sugar high. If you listen to it long enough, it starts to slow down. That is the crash in the sugar high. But it will start up again. After you get sushi, you will be locked into Junior Troopa appearing if you try to leave the island, since you can now come back via blue pipe once you defeat Super Blooper. The jungle's not so bad, guys! Are you crazy? What's wrong with you? The jungle is dangerous sushi said so! I got stuck inside a dark cave where Mario needed what and couldn't have sushi out so I could tell her I'm sorry, which I am. What have you been doing? Sleeping in a tree away and above all the danger like some kind of lazy bum? I'd rather play a post bench with my pen pal Dainty. If you played the game before and are familiar with it, a speedrunner or someone who wants to save time would not talk to the bubble up here since they'll just tell you that the seed is not ready and they'll be out of the ground anyway after the chapter boss is defeated, after which they tell you they gave the seed away to Colorado. Listen to the music that plays when you rescue all the Yoshi kids. This is the only time you hear that music. It's not used anywhere else in the game. Imagine what else this music could have been used for. Look at that. Are you telling me that Nintendo won't spring to have sprite animations of characters signing things and yet they'll spring for an animation of Chungus Yoshi reaching to get a Jade Raven for us and I'm the nitpicky one? One thing I like about Sushi is that she's the only partner of Mario who's a mother, as revealed when she gets a letter from her daughter Sashimi in the post office at Toad Town, which says she's about to have a baby. So Mario has a partner who is someone's grandson, temporarily had one who's a grandpa, and has one who's a soon-to-be grandma. Now let's move on to how awesome it is when you get to the raven tree and that you climb the tree and the music that plays when you climb it. It's so awesome! Going up to Raphael the raven, the master of the island. It was an amazing experience the first time and it's an awesome experience now with a happy heart badge along the way to serve as a symbol of how happy this makes me. After you get his help, and the smaller ravens build the thing to get you to the volcano, with Colorado volunteering as the test dummy for it, we go into the volcano where Colorado does absolutely nothing except slow us down, including in the second phase of the Lava Piranha fight. Seriously, he just runs up and he gets his ass burned. That, that's all. That, that, that's all he does to help us with that fight. Seriously. Isn't it weird how the blocks in this volcano are made of metal, yet they break apart like every other block with the Ultra Hammer rather than getting bent out of shape or something? Yep, that's how the game works. This is the only time in the game that a Star Spirit helps us with anything during between when they are rescued and before a Peach segment. Colorado becomes willing to die just like his father for a volcano vase. And of course, everyone makes it out of the volcano just in time, even though Colorado refers to Miss Star as a starfish. For an explorer, Colorado sucks at identifying other creatures, doesn't he? The Peach segment that follows is just a quiz with another 64 reference. I've never seen anyone get one answer wrong on this quiz, but the Koopa Troll on the left named Spiky Tom is good at questions and never gets one wrong, while Spiky John on the right seems to barely get to answer any from what I've seen. You win a jam and jelly for winning, for Peach to put in the chest for Mario. Then the hammer bro is stupid enough to give Peach a sneaky parasol as a participation prize. Just because we need it for the next Peach segment. Then we cut back to Mistar putting Mario, his partner, and a sad Colorado down. Was everything during the Peach segment happening simultaneously, or was Mistar holding them in the air the whole time it happened? Because that's quite a while. But it doesn't matter. Now it's a matter of the vase 
for the seed. And if you haven't done so already after getting sushi, now we have to fight Junior Troop as we leave the island, who will lose half his health. 10 HP loss from the swim to the island, and another 10 from swimming the way back. God damn it! I had wins! If I had just flown to the island like Joe LeMame, I would finally have my revenge on Mario! I'm such a ass! But at least I'm a so it's going to try again two chapters from now. But he'll try to compensate by being a spiky flyer. Still getting his eggshell covered ass handed to him by Mario. Now we go into flower fields. Chapter 6 has six paths to take and feeding the red color berry to each flower guard, including the bubble flower if you think about it, is the way to go. Posey here lets Mario have only one crystal berry throughout the whole chapter. I can't imagine who would want more than one crystal berry. Come on, give us some crystal berries! So many crystal berries, we'll be able to clean out that guy selling medals! Good luck with the Amazing Daisy, Mario! I will not allow these bastards so much as one first strike! I consider that a soiled first strike record. Not one first strike, do you hear me? The board at Mario's house keeps track of every battle, every first strike I make, every first strike the enemies make, and I will not let the enemies have so much as one because that goes on my permanent record. The Glitz Pit Goomba's first strike from Thousand Year Door is the only exception, the only enemy first strike I would ever allow, and Thousand Year Door doesn't even track first strikes like this game does. After after Mario gets Jonathan, I mean Spike, I mean Lackalester as a partner who can now help Mario cheat the Lil Loinks farm, Mario can destroy the cloud machine, plant the seed, and we get to listen to this beanstalk music which sounds like it was composed by Grant Kirkhope. After we defeat Huff and Puff in the highly underutilized cloud area, we come to the most fun Peach segment where we can pretend we're playing as a Koopa Troll. If Peach uses the parasol to become a hammer bro instead, she doesn't wield a hammer. This is weird because when she uses the parasol to copy a clubba that's sleeping outside the castle, she is seen holding a club. Kudos to Bowser's minions for being stupid enough not to know that a hammer bro without a hammer is not a fake. <laughs> After Peach almost makes it to the top of the castle and we almost get to see the castle balcony when it isn't smashed to make a bridge, we come back to Mario who visits Merlin, gets the Ultra Boots, and goes to Shiver City where he can't leave to the east without the mayor's permission, similar to chapter 4 of Thousand Year Door, nor can he literally break the ice without getting in trouble. You can't treat me like this! Do you know who I am? I am a Mario! The mayor's wife is a reversal of the idiot husband cliche in TV shows. She takes pity on Mario, but then denies it when she finds her husband, the mayor, unconscious, but thought to be dead in a game, you know, for kids. Now we gotta walk past the penguins covering the spot with the star piece if you didn't already get it. Thanks a lot, idiots. Seriously, that, that that's my star piece you, you guys are covering. Get off, get off of there. They're not gonna get off until we solve this mystery. To solve the mystery, we gotta break the ice, get this guy, Herringway, and the mayor with his interesting picking up animation hands Herringway the badge icon placeholder icon so Mario can now leave Shiver City and fight Junior Troopa again. Monstar is a joke boss despite his attack looking threatening and Goombario not knowing any better. Of course no one who played Master Quest would look at this the same way again. Finally we come to the place where Mario can do the second to last part of the chain letter for the Lucky Day badge, get the scarf, then make like in Thousand Year Door and backtrack all the way back to Shiver City for the bucket, both of these for the snowmen guarding the way to Shiver Mountain. Strider 7 x made a video about how these snowmen are really just invisible penguins riding inanimate snowmen, and I'm inclined to believe that. Now we come to the part of the game where Mario gets his ass handed to him by Duplicos! Duplicos the full his ass! Hey! Get out of here, you stupid duplicates! Once Mario makes it to Merlar, past an invisible wall that he'll have to remember for the Riddle Tower and Thousand Year Door, listens to this long story exposition and gets the star key, loses access to Merlar but gains access to Crystal Palace, fights off more duplicates and clubbas, the former of which stopped trying at some point, and finally... Can't go through here on the castle. Can't go through here on the castle. Damn it! It would be so much less annoying to just fight these things! But Vanilla Paper Mario never made it, so did it. 
the mass requested. Anyway, Crystal King, Peach segment where we do nothing like the one from the prologue. Bowser saying heads will roll in a game for kids. Mario going up to Starway, which for some reason has enemies called Embers. Break out the ice power and fire shield badges for this. Now we finally get to Star Haven, which has a modest shop and a toad house. For the second to last shop of the game, the item selection could be better. Like, repel gels, ultra shrooms, and gem and jellies kind of better. But it's not. Chuck Quizmo can appear in Star Haven too. Speaking of Chuck Quizmo, having to track him down 64 times to get all his star pieces. 64 of the game's 100. 160 star pieces is annoying and you're better off doing that after chapter 7 when they're all available and just talking to him as you see him. Whenever you answer a question right, Vanity, his assistant, will cheer for you. But when you get a question wrong, she just doesn't react. This is weird considering that there are sprites in the game of Vanity being sad. Was this a mistake or did Nintendo simply not want us to feel worse than we already did when we got a question wrong? Especially since the board at Mario's house keeps track of how many attempts you made at answering Chuck Cosmo's questions versus the number of times you get a question right. It can go all the way up to 64 out of 65 if you're that bad. Anyway, you reach the Star Sanctuary you get the star beam, the very thing you need to counter the effects of Bowser's rod. Not many people know this, but it can also be used to nullify an enemy's positive status effects like boosted attack, defense, invisibility, electrification, any positive status that a magic koopa for example would give an enemy. So it has uses outside of just battle with Bowser, which is good because you definitely need this if you were playing Master Quest. You also get a mode of transportation called the Starship that looks like something that came out of a Mario Party minigame to reach Bowser's castle, because where else would Mario dock it when Bowser's castle probably has aerial defenses or something? Or the Starship can only go that far. Oh, I'm sorry Mr. Lameen, but we don't have another other starship for you. That's okay, Star Spirits. I can just get there in the cringiest way possible. The cringiest way, you say? Yeah, yeah. See you in Mario 45! <laughs> Bowser's Castle serves not just as the last part of the game, but the ultimate test to see if you know how to use every partner at your disposal properly. At least that's how it is after the first guard door sends you plummeting to a prison only for you to escape and then have to cool down some lava. Getting that third deep focus badge outside the castle, which for some reason at first looks like an unused badge called super deep focus right before you collect it, is absolutely critical. Like, you need to do it the first time you get here, because if you don't get it now, you'll have to do some serious backtracking where you meet the first guard door again all the way back all, 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 all the way back from where the guard door is all the way back down and to the very left in order to get all the way back to where the badge was it's a lot of backtracking just to get into the mode speaking of backtracking chapter 8 has a ton of it now the rom hacks pro mode and master quest mitigated this by adding a blue warp pipe to the outside of peach's castle but we're talking about the vanilla game here the regular snes version of mario Mario RPG has the same problem with Smithy's Factory, which the Switch remake fixed, and don't get me started on Thousand Year Door for GameCube. Seriously, getting past the first guard door is the end of the first leg in this Bowser's Castle triathlon. Only the beginning of the second leg has a shot, which is a pain to come back to whether you're backtracking or forth tracking. Even in Master Quest, did you know that the spiked Goomba shopkeeper there buys mistakes and pebbles for 20 coins each? The game's most desperate shopkeeper, everybody! The jail cells at the beginning of the second and third legs of the castle double as total houses if you can fight off the Koopa Trolls that have the keys. Those uncomfortable ledges are the only bed in the game with no covers so you can see Mario sleeping before it irises to black. After this section of pulling chains, flooding the place, getting the key, then doing it all in reverse, we come to the long hallway of bombshell bills. The regular bullet bills at the Koopa Brothers Fortress only appear right before the Koopa Bros themselves and never appear again after that. And yet these bombshell bills are here to stay no matter what. Not 
not very practical if you ask me. As far as the quiz goes, the only enemies out of those doors that Mario actually has to fight are the three anti-guys if he fails the quiz. Why is another kind of no? Okay, so outside section, a puzzle where the torches show you the way, a duplicate pretending to be Peach, and the Koopa grows again, whom we don't get to fight in favor of one last battle with little sh. Well, there goes any reason to exist. Yeah, but at least you can listen to the Bowser's Castle and Final Battle music from this game, both of which are different in Mario's story than they are in the original game. I'm spouting useless information, aren't I? That's a very perceptive perspective, but I think I'm just going to go and be forgotten about. Some people think the jail cells are the final toad houses in the game, but they're not. Remember the toad in the room on the first floor where the last stand badge is found? He'll let you sleep in the bed. This is the only way to heal right before the final Bowser fight. That heart block before the junior trooper fight was the last heart block in the game. First, a warm-up battle against Bowser right in front of a broken window, which is where Mario gets justice for what happened at the beginning of the game. And then we go to the final save block, and then we get to the smashed balcony that we never get to see when it's not smashed to make this bridge cue the final battle starbeam fails then we get a scripted fight of twink versus kami koopa which you will win twink and kami each have 10 hp but peach keeps using focus on twink and kami does less damage while twink does more eventually taking out kami koopa who only has 10 health in this game versus having 50 in thousand year door then the final battle really begins then dun, 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 Mario gets the Star Rod back from Bowser! All the power of Star Haven, the power of the stars, everything! It all belongs to Mario now! But Mario gets no time to use it because the battle was so intense that the platform and Bowser's castle explode! Peach's castle survives the explosion thanks to a barrier and slowly descends back to its original spot. Look closely right before it zooms in on Mario in the scene where Mario gives the star rod back to the star spirits. You can still see part of Bowser's castle there. The spiky guardrails too. The developers removed the torches in the background so they could have removed those other parts too or at least cropped the camera view better to really fully sell the illusion that Bowser's castle is completely gone and that Peach's castle is floating in the sky. All the power of the star rod but of course Mario with all that glorious power does the right thing and gives it back to the star spirits followed by more ending dialogue with praise and stuff. Happy ending and dialogue aside don't I get any praise? Oh Joe Levine you get to hear me say this we will see you again in Mario Party 5 just as you said. Right. Okay then. Bye. The way the star spirits move as they leave, the way they sway, it says something about their respective personalities. Then more cutscenes, cutscenes, cutscenes. Ah! Mario and Luigi going back to Peach's castle. This time Mario is in control after they come out of the pipe. But he can't wander off anywhere except for back to the house to read the last two entries of Luigi's diary. I think Luigi should have his wish to sleep in the top bunk bed granted. He's skinnier than Mario so he must weigh less. That way Mario doesn't have to drag his big he uh, Never mind. He can just jump to the top bunk. Seeing the outside of the castle instead of a big empty hole is nice. Unfortunately, we can't do any more exploring of the castle as I stated earlier in the video. We already did all the exploring we've ever done before or Mario defeated Bowser and the game's normal status quo. Now we have to talk about the game's credits. Luigi can lead the parade since he obviously feels the need to lead as much as he can, plus he didn't get to do much in the game so you know we'll give him this and whatever he can get in Thousand Year Door. Also he was the first one out of the castle at the beginning of the game as far as I can tell. Now let's talk about the rest of the parade. As I said earlier in the video one of the late motifs is the new partner music from the Japanese Mario story. Only only the motif used for the parade doesn't sound like West Side Story's America enough not to be distinguished. The sprite animations the partners have are also unique to this. Many of them are anyway. The rest of the parade also looks very unrealistic with the way everything looks. This includes the characters, like how Vanity supposedly stops to clap for Chuck Quizmo when she is still moving with the parade while stopped when she should be walking and clapping at the same time. How the heck is a lake moving with the rest of the parade? 
and the nest too! Where it's revealed that Buzz Arm maybe is a female. The Yoshi babies and Gourmet Guy eating Huff and Puff and his minions. Does this mean they were cotton candy all along? Hard to believe. Or maybe they just like the way they take- Sorry, I'm being nitpicky. So much about this parade makes no sense. And apparently it's not supposed to matter, nor am I supposed to care. I have been way too nitpicky, haven't I? And I believe that's it. I don't want to go into way too much detail or we'll be here all day. I'd rather actually do a playthrough for that. Paper Mario is one of the best games ever released. It holds a candle to its predecessor Mario RPG in its own unique way. It doesn't feel like a sequel to that game in some ways since it had to become its own thing, and yet in a few ways it does since it was first marketed as one. With its unique battle system and its badge system, it's no wonder that this game stood the test of time even when we got crappier sequels like Sticker Star. It's no thousand year door, but we wouldn't even have Thousand Year Door if it wasn't for this game. It's something I'm happy to come back to once in a while, which if you saw this video this far, I certainly did, and wasn't that refreshing? That's the end of the game, and the end of this perceptive perspective. It's also the part where Peach would kiss Mario, but won't because I think it went unused for the final game. But not for Master Quest though. I'd be happy to revisit this game. If I ever did a video about Paper Mario Master Quest, a ROM hack by Ham, where I would of course highlight the biggest differences most in a very unique way, because I'm Joe Lamine. But we'll have to wait until then. For more Joe Lamine content, like, subscribe, hit that bell icon, and check this out!